So a lot of people I feel who might be listening to this might go, oh, well, I can't eat that because it really triggers me. Or, you know, I don't, I get heavily bloated when I eat too many mm. beans. What would you say to those people that are listening that suffer with IBS or more severely IBD and actually really struggle to consume these I foods? I would really recommend that they see a dietitian. Mm. <laughs> Dr. Heidi Stoudacre in our team, she did mm-hmm. her PhD at King's College in London, is really one of the world experts on IBS and diet and the gut. And now she's really looking closely at mental health because depression and anxiety are highly comorbid with IBS, meaning that they very often go together. Mm. And of course, you've got this bi-directional communication between the brain and the gut. They talk to each other all the time. So if you're really stressed or worried or what have you, that will affect your gut and vice versa. So you can actually do a a top-down and or a bottom-up approach, like (laughs) literally. Um, So the top-down are things like hypnotherapy, antidepressants, relaxation, all of those things that are apparently helpful in IBS. I'm not the expert Mindfulness, meditation. those sorts of things. And you can also take dietary approach to it. I think, again, there's some really interesting data that Heidi's generated from a trial that she's done that's not yet published, so I can't talk about it, but it, it addresses this very thing. There was a great study published last year. It was only a small study, but it was published in Cell. It was led by the Sonnenbergs, who are a fantastic duo over in, the, in America who are microbiologists, I think. And what they did was they took Americans who largely have a really terrible diet. We call it the SAD, the standard American diet. <laughs> and they wanted to see whether they could increase the diversity of the gut microbes and reduce inflammation through dietary approaches. So one group were um, helped over a period of two or three weeks to increase their intake of fermented foods. That was the only thing they changed, fermented foods. So yogurt, kefir, kombucha, sauerkraut, etc. Um, up to six serves a day. And now, remember, a serve only needs to be small. And then the other group were helped to in- increase the amount of fibre in their diet. So whether it was lentils, beans, you know, grains, these sorts of things. And what they saw was that the people in the high fermented foods diet, their gut microbiota diversity went up and their inflammation went down. So yay, that was a win. In the other group, the high fibre group, some people did really well. Um, inflammation down, diversity up. Others did really badly. And they thought, oh, hang on. If these people have got like a a (laughs) desert-like microbiome Mm. or a a (laughs) microbiome that doesn't have the bacteria that we know that are needed to break down fibre because that's the primary role of the gut bacteria is to break down the bits of food that our human enzymes can't break down, which is primarily fibre from complex carbohydrates and also the polyphenols from the plants. If they don't have those bacteria, they're not going to be able to break the fibre down and Mm. that could cause a problem. They thought, well, maybe there might be undigested fibre in the stool, which would tell us whether this is true or not. And that's what they found. So if people had low diversity to start with, they just did not do well with a high fibre diet. And so again, you'll see people saying, I can't eat that, I can't eat that. Now, that may well be true. Mm. So you need support to be able to improve your gut, whether it's both, I would say, top down and bottom up approaches. Mm. So relaxation, hypnotherapy, all of those sorts of things that we know are really helpful for people with IBS, but also very, very gradual changes to your diet. If you're going to introduce fibre, do it really slowly. Take little bits of fermented foods with the high fibre foods so that you're helping your gut to start to adapt. I love that tip. Yeah. I've Take been... fermented foods with small bits of fibre yes. and also drink a lot of water because, again, drink that's a lot really of water. important. Now, I should specify... There's no research to confirm that yet. This is just a a hunch based on what we see so Mm. far in the literature. Mm. It's certainly worth a go, but this is where dietitians are so important. People go on these low FODMAP diets. They're never meant to be more than short term. Six weeks, yeah. Yeah, but people just stay on them and they avoid FODMAPs. But FODMAPs are actually key food for the gut microbes. Mm -hmm. You don't make, you're only going to make the problem worse by Mm. avoiding them. Mm. So I think that that is a strategy that hopefully will be tested soon and people will be able to actually go, okay, so this for me might be helpful. I think it's also just really important where you kept emphasising 
slowly introducing because I do think sometimes we hear something we go right that's the answer let's just have <laughs> as much fiber I'm gonna have as much fermented foods in my diet as possible and then all of a sudden our gut goes what's happening oh yeah and it becomes you completely... will get a tummy ache I can <laughs> tell you right now <laughs> because completely overwhelmed oh, yeah. I and mean, then it's working in travel time yeah um, and so I do think anything regarding your diet hence why you've mentioned dietitian it's really important to see somebody if you are making quite big changes to your diet please mm. see someone who can hold your hand and offer you advice and support um but again small things you know what else is really interesting what? i just thought of it so heidi has um recently secured research funding to look at the nocebo response so you know placebo you know that placebo response is a real thing mm-hmm. i mean your body your brain will manufacture molecules it will do things quite physically in response to a belief that something is good for you. It's a tablet or something's going to do something. There's also nocebos. If you think that something's going to hurt, something's going to make you feel sick, something's going to give you bloating, something's, you know, nocebos are a thing as well. Very much a thing. Wow. So that's something to also consider is that people assume that something's going to disagree with them or that they can't eat that and that may in itself induce that response. Mm -hmm. We don't know this for sure, we're going to investigate it, but certainly we see it in other aspects of health. Thanks so much for listening. To hear the full episode, there's a link in the description.